Tony Schiavone. Hey, Aubrey. How, How are you doing? doing? I'm doing great. It's great to have everyone back with us on All Elite Wrestling Unrestricted. Unrestricted. It's the official podcast of AEW. We are with John Moxley. Hey, <laughs> hey John. John. Good John. to see you. Hey, I made it. You Let's, did make it. I wanted to talk about your beginnings in wrestling. Uh, you're from Cincinnati. How did you first discover pro wrestling as a kid? I don't remember a time before it. Really? There was a couple kids who lived in an apartment underneath me who had like wrestling figures and some old, old WWF videotapes that might have been not necessarily old at the time, but uh, I remember watching it at their house and that's kind of my first memories. I mean, pretty much it was just always the uh, the thing that I liked. That and Ninja Turtles and stuff like that, you know? Yeah. I, I had the Ninja Turtle action figures. They had the car that shot the pizzas. Oh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Oh, dude, that was legit. <laughs> You were uh, you were really big into Bret Hart. When's the first time you saw him wrestle? Um, probably Memories. around that same time. Yeah, like early uh, mid '90s. Bret was the guy. Right. Mm -hmm. I kind of missed Hulkamania. I was born in 1985, so by the time I was watching and could understand what was going on, say, you I'm, moved say I'm like seven, he's already kind of out. Right. Like, Bret was the guy at that point. Sure. So you know he'd be on like WWF superstars or the Saturday morning shows and. Uh, you know, I'd watch the, uh, there was a lot less wrestling content back then. You know, there might have been one hour show a week, or there was WCW too, but uh, I never really saw much WCW until a little later, until like the Nitro days. I was never exposed to it. But, you know, you find that one hour a week on was about uh, all there was back then, but there was videotapes. So I was obsessed with videotapes. You were a tape trader? Dude, I would, uh, I'd go to every video store, every flea market, every... <laughs> Anywhere where they sold VHS tapes and scour for every single possible wrestling tape I could find and uh, Kind of started piecing together kind of the hit. I remember like kind of piecing together the history of stuff from like Okay, this was from 89. This was WrestleMania 6 or whatever and then this is 7 and then kind of like I remember like writing stuff down like writing like title histories down when I was a kid like okay, oh, wow. like Kind of trying to compile the history through like videotapes, you know, because you're getting it all kind of scattered. Yeah, yeah, that's crazy. Wow. So, as, as this big fan, uh, you finally get your chance in in wrestling, and, and let's talk about when you first started wrestling. When did when did that happen? I know Les Thatcher has a lot to do with your career, and yeah, I started when I was. Uh, I first walked through the door as I was 16 years old. I guess I was maybe like a. It was right by the time I left high school. Mm -hmm. I guess I would have been a junior in high school. It was 2003, I guess. So I went to, I saw an advertisement for, it was a company that I started called HWA. At the time, it was a, uh, it's Heartland Wrestling. Heartland At Wrestling. the time, it was like a developmental territory for WWE. And uh, so they had a lot of like farm guys, developmental guys there. So they had some really good shows. It was, you know, Jamie Noble was there, mm -hmm. Spanky, uh, the Island Boys. One of which was uh, Roman Reigns' brother. The other one was Umaga, B.J. Whitmer. Uh, oh, shit. Yeah, crazy roster of talent for a little uh, local promotion. But I saw an advertisement for the show, and it was at a place called Red Barn Flea Market. And I was like, oh, dude, I've, I've never really seen live wrestling. I'd been to one show with, like, nosebleed seats, but I could never, you know, that was a WCW house show or something, like, super nosebleed seats. It's not really the same thing as being there. Because every time we'd come through, like, Cincinnati Gardens, I couldn't afford to go because I didn't have any money. Right. So, like, I would stand outside and, like, I remember me and my friend trying to find a way to sneak in. We just <laughs> couldn't, like, th through the back loading door where they're, like, bringing in pizzas and stuff. We couldn't. You're couldn't, never successful. Couldn't, couldn't get in. No. So, I seen this. So, I went to this show and it was up close and personal, like, and it was mind boggling. Everybody just seemed so humongous to me. Like physically, like well, because they were, yeah, like <laughs> massive. Yeah. I mean, larger than life in a sense, but like just actually physically huge. Right. I remember the first guy who came through the curtain was a guy named Johnny the Bull, and he, he looked like the largest human I've ever seen in my life, just jacked up, <laughs> and, just like, oh. and just seeing uh, wrestling like up close and personal for the first time, and like feeling like the contact and like noticing like how loud the the noise the ring made and stuff. I was like. Oh man, and it, it it was like literally close enough I could like reach out and touch it. Mm -hmm. It started to be like this, like this could happen. 
I had no idea how to get into wrestling. Right. But at that moment, you know that it's real and it's a thing that people yeah. could do. It seemed like it was so much, you know, the internet was already around and stuff back then. Yeah. But it was like before smartphones and everybody had phone and stuff. I didn't ever have the internet because I didn't have a computer. So the only time I would ever be like online would be like if we had computer lab in school or something like right. that. So I had no idea how to get started. Or that if it, was, if it was impossible. Because like back then, there was so much more magic. It's not like, oh, you know everybody's real names and everybody's on Twitter now. Like Me and my friends just talk like, like what's the Undertaker like in real life, you think? Like You think he's like that all the time? Right. <laughs> like, you think he like sleeps in a... In an urn. In a casket? Because you, know? you don't know. <laughs> right. right. They're, you're like, who are these people and how do they get into it? Because it was you know a clo- more closed off world. So I, I had no idea where to begin. But in the program... You know, like they put together a little program. Yeah, they've got it at the show. The advertisements for like the local pizza shop and the matches for a night or whatever. But on the back, it was Les Thatcher's Main Event Pro Wrestling Camp. Want to be a wrestler or whatever. And had like the address. So you're immediately like, And I was like, me. yeah, I knew it immediately. It was like a light from the heaven show. And it was just like, oh. I, that's exactly, that's where I'm going. No question about it. And I sent him, uh, I sent Les Thatcher a physical letter. <laughs> and, he re- and he replied to me with a physical letter that was typed on a typewriter and i'm like who owned a typewriter <laughs> well, that's true, <laughs> after that. like 1990 maybe but uh that's old school he was like getting a weight training program and this and that and whatever and uh you had to be 18 to start so i was like i'm just gonna kind of like try to fudge this and just so i just showed up at the school so you just didn't admit you were 16 yeah and we talked for a little while and everything and i always remember this too when I pulled up, I was like super nervous because I'm like, oh my, you know, I don't know what's going to be behind behind these doors or whatever. I've, ne- I've never seen anybody like training wrestling. Right. I had no idea like what goes into it. I'm like, how much is real? How much is fit? Did they just, it's a completely you, I don't know how you, you. I don't know how you put it together. Mm-hmm. I'm the most obsessed fan in the world, <laughs> but I, I have no idea how. You know like, shit. I don't know how like a wrestling match gets put together. I don't know how to do how like. How do we decide to finish? Like, I, I don't know how any of this stuff works. And I remember pulling up uh, to like the back. The school was like, uh, like many are, like, uh, like a loading dock mm-hmm. kind of. What, what do you call that? It's like a, like a truck storage, yeah, like a warehouse. Yeah, like a kind of a warehouse, right. a strip mall kind of thing with all the units or whatever. So like, pull up to the it's back, nothing fancy, where there's like a the big door. garage door. And yep. It sounded like somebody was shooting guns. <laughs> it sounds exactly like before, if you ever go to like a shooting range yeah. and you hear like the pop pop, it was like pow, pow, pow. It was so loud and it was like reverberating off the garage door. I'm like, what the hell is going on in there? It was just people taking bumps and right. taking falls. And it was so loud and I was like, it's it's like gunshots. <laughs> and this dude named Matt Stryker, not the one that was like the announcer on TV, is a right. different Matt Stryker, right. the, the unibrow. <laughs> awesome wrestler. Yeah. Uh, S-T-R-Y-K-E-R. Mm-hmm. He was the man. If you ever if you find any footage of him. And I'd seen him on the on the show. So he was like the biggest star in the world to me. And he just opened the door and stuck his head out. And I was like, uh, I'm coming to like check out school or whatever. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I talked to Les for a while. And then he brought me in to watch some of the training session. And like, it was like the Wizard of Oz. Seeing like they the wizard. They the back. Like the curtain was pulled back. I was like, oh my God. Like seeing people, I remember they were like working on like punches and strikes and stuff like that. And uh, a guy named Cody Hawk was the primary trainer at that point. Les was kind of more of just the uh, name of the marquee kind of thing. The guy who handled most of the day to day physical in the ring was a guy named Cody Hawk, who's a, who's an awesome worker too. And, uh, Talked to him after the practice. I sat there and watched the whole thing for like three hours, just like transfixed. Mm-hmm. And uh, talked to a couple of guys and whatever. And he was like, "Yeah, if you want to just hang out at, at uh, you know, sweep the floors, help set up the ring, or whatever, be ring crew or whatever, do." So he basically let me start hanging at the shows and help setting up the ring. And I would go to like practices and just watch and just be like, "Okay, I'm just gonna study everything, and then uh, I'll go." do the drills like on my own or whatever if I'm not allowed to start. I, and they ended up just like before the show, like somebody would throw me in a ring and start messing around with me. And I, mean, I just kind of sli- slipped in and uh, started training full time in like probably early 2004. 
Our first match in June of 2004. So, but it was like old school, old school camp. You know, like Les mm-hmm. was worked in the 60s. And it was uh, right. like, it was like Pretty minimum six ring. months of training before you even get to have a match. Like yeah. you had to be something of a, not a seasoned pro, but you had to be like capable. They wouldn't just throw you out there and let you look like an idiot. Like you see some, like a lot of schools probably do or indie shows, you know, see people who are like, that doesn't look like a pro wrestler. That's like training a kid, for a few months. kid playing pro wrestler. You right. know? Right. Like you had to like be in shape, look good, have a good gimmick or whatever they were big on like gimmicks you know they they had a guy named chip fairway who was a golfer they they had uh, (laughs) pepper parks who is now the blade who was a male cheerleader his partner was a football (laughs) player named chet the jet (laughs) cody hawk was a surfer you know uh so so where did john moxley come from actually uh they get there was another kid at the school named jimmy and uh since i was literally like high school age they want us to be like stoner football players <laughs> he's just like he's either i'm either gonna make you the biggest stoner or like some kind of like stoner jock football player or something and they ended up giving him the same thing and they made us a gimmick and they gave us a cheerleader pepper parks no oh. it was a female cheerleader named Jen, <laughs> who i'm still friends with to this day so we were like this I still had a practice football jersey from when I played football in high school. So that was like what I wore to the ring and mm-hmm. like wore like white football pants. And we just do like comedy stuff. Like we were like buffoons. Like we would like accidentally run into each other and stuff like that and do all this football related nonsense. You know, when you're starting to, it's easier, I think, to start rather than just jumping right in having serious 20, 30 minute matches when you have like a gimmick to rely on, when, mm-hmm. you, when you don't really know what you're doing. You can kind of hide you, behind that. Well, you moment. have like a shtick. Mm-hmm. Yeah, you can, and then kind of figure it out as you go along. But anyway, so I didn't have a name. You were I'd just probably, stoner been, I'd probably been thinking about names for years and years, but I had, I had no ideas. Because the day we had our first match, it was just like, you know, the always bring your gear, you never know when you're going to have your first match thing. Like, right, I, right, I had right. no idea I was going to have a match that day. I thought I was just, you know, sitting, dude, security and sell so, the soda floors. pop or whatever. And yeah. they're like, yep, you're in a whatever third match. And I was like, oh, I remember being so nervous. There's 14 people in the crowd or something like that. But I was like, oh, my God. <laughs> now I don't get nervous at all. Right. But for that day, I was like, I almost immediately shit my pants. <laughs> <laughs> There's more like, people in the locker room so than like, in the crowd. Right yeah. before uh, I'm about to go out. And the ringer's like, what, "What's the name?" And Cody's like, "What? What, what name did you go by?" I'm like, "I, I don't really have one. I don't. I, I don't. I was baffled. I froze up. I didn't have a good name. But we had the the football uniforms on, and this other wrestler guy who's just like, it's, from, it's like the Varsity Blues guy. He's like the guy from Varsity Blues, John Jonathan Moxley. They're like, that's cool. And I was like, oh, okay. I was too nervous to say yes or no or whatever. I was just like, okay. <laughs> And that literally on the spot within 90 seconds. That was your name. That's where the name come from. Actually, in the movie, what's that guy's name? It, the, uh, the guy from, like, James Vanderbeek. James yeah. Vanderbeek. Oh, thank you. Oh, James. there we go. In the movie, it was Mock's son. Oh, no. John Moxon. So the guy screwed up the name a little bit. Well, mm-hmm. there you go. Then you're not copying which it, somebody. Yeah. Which, so it's, It worked. Yeah. It wasn't my idea at all. It was just, it's like, throw, it was just foist upon me. And I just, and I just, after I would drop the football thing after like six months or however long it was, I just kept the name locally and then just I've always kept it. And I don't, I don't mind it. it. You know, it works. Well, it sure does. We're talking with John Moxley on AW Unrestricted, and we're going to be talking about uh, his move into the WWE. John, you were talking about the, your first uh, foray into pro wrestling and. You were such a big fan of pro wrestling. Talk about moving into the WWE. How long did that take? It took a long time. You are in the indies for a while. Yeah. I never really had a... I didn't have tons of success on the indies, actually. Mm -hmm. I didn't really start getting any buzz or any notoriety until, like, maybe 2009 into 10. And then by 2011, I was in WWE. Like five, six years. 2011, I was in WWE in the May of 2011. The first five, six years, yeah, whatever it was, I just really couldn't get nothing going for myself. Mm-hmm. I was completely unknown. Like, I was trained very well and had very good experience, and uh, but just didn't have anything that made me stand out or anything. Just didn't really have any opportunities. Everything kind of always came up short. So I wrestled 
for uh, HWA every Tuesday night on the shows on the weekends. Uh, any kind of like local, anything that anybody was driving to, any mom and pop at a fairgrounds show, whatever. Just doing whatever. Yeah, uh, working whatever. Wor- job working ever. Working every job for two weeks before you uh, get fired and could, for not showing up. Yep. Man, I wish Uber had been around back then. <laughs> That's like, like what the Uber cool thing everyone's and, doing now. Uber and Postmates, because you just do it whenever you can. That would be like the perfect indie wrestler job. There's quite a few people in the indies I know who just do Uber and Postmates because yeah, you, 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 you can work it around your kids. Yeah, you could do it wherever you are, too. Yeah. yeah back, the best job I ever had, though, around that period was a factory. Yeah, it's a tough job. It was like moving stuff around in a factory. But it was Sunday through Thursday nights, oh, 11 perfect. to 7 in the morning. So I was able to sustain that one for a while because I'd get back from whatever show on Saturday or whatever just in time to get to work like Sunday at uh, 11 p.m. So I'd like sleep all day and then wake up, then go to training, and then go right to work. So I had a good thing going there for a while. But uh, anyway, uh, I spent almost a year in Puerto Rico. That ended up drying up. But mostly just like, and by the time it was like 2000. Seven or eight or something like that. Like it was really looking pretty bleak. Mm-hmm. I always knew in the back of my mind. I was like, I knew I'd watch dudes on WWE and I'd be like, or on TV, or TNA or whatever it was, and I'd be like, I can hang. It's just nobody in the world knows who I am. I couldn't get anybody to exactly. pay any attention to me. Exactly, I, just, yeah. I didn't know how for the longest time. And uh, HWA ended up shutting down, and that had been like my home. So when that was done. There was like a really tough period there where I was like, I guess I just didn't make it. Not like I really quit necessarily, but I was just like, it was like decided. I couldn't get booked at like anywhere. Like the only thing I had going was like some really crappy local Cincinnati matches that like I, I was like embarrassed to even being in a ring with some of these guys. I was mm-hmm. just like working a regular job. I was just like, I guess I just didn't make it. Like for a while, I was like, I guess it just didn't happen. So how did WWE get in touch with you? Uh, so a little bit before that. It's maybe like 2008. Uh, this guy, Dan, who ran a company called Insanity Pro Wrestling in mm-hmm. Indianapolis, uh, he was taken over as like book as the booker. And he wanted, I'd worked a couple of shows there or whatever, but I hadn't been back in a while. And he randomly called me out of the blue while I was at work once. And was just like, look, I want to do, I want our big program to be you and this guy named Drake Younger. Hey. And uh, he's like, I'm taking over his booker and whatever and he wanted me to be like one of his feature guys mm-hmm. and like no nobody ever called me the stuff like that you know what i mean mm-hmm. if i had to get booked somewhere i had to like call somebody and ask somebody to get on or whatever and like i just had i was so low at that point that i was like oh somebody actually being nice to me and okay sure so i'm like i didn't think it was gonna be any kind of a big deal or anything but i went to uh that was kind of a big turning point. Cause so I went back to IPW, started working with uh, Drake Younger, who was kind of in the uh, into kind of like the death match scene, mm-hmm. sort of. That's kind of what he's he was in for. CZW, and uh, he was doing matches like that IW at Mid South and stuff like that. And around the same time, I really just started like I was in such a dark place mentally. I was just working through a bunch of like deep seated like you know, the emotional crap and just was angry and just making bad decisions. And just like, I was a a maniac back then and just kind of poured it all into myself being a character kind of, and just kind of letting loose being like, just kind of really embracing the bad parts of myself and Mm -hmm. um, really kind of got on a roll with like promos. I'd always been able to like talk, but like once I started, so I started working with Drake and all of a sudden, the matches start becoming like real violent mm-hmm. because he kind of had that style anyway. And I never really like had that kind of style. But where I was at, like personally, it was like the perfect kind of uh, forum to take out your aggressions on your opponent. Yeah, yeah like it, even like kind of when you're getting beat up yourself, you know, like bleeding and falling on glass and stuff like that. You know, it's almost like it's almost a strange kind of like puts you at peace cathartic like kind of thing yeah it's very strange so so like my style started changing then all of a sudden stuff started picking up for me really fast and then i ended up uh working in chicago and then like off that ipw all of a sudden i just started working like 
every indie. Mm-hmm. And then I started going to Philadelphia working for CZW, which was huge for me. That yes. was, that's that was where I first like be- started becoming like a known name. Mm-hmm. Like my name started getting like mentioned places or whatever. And then parlay that into I started working for a company called Dragon Gate USA, mm-hmm. who was Booker was a guy named Gabe Sapolsky. Who he he looks for Evolve now. Yeah, who everybody knows. And once he he got a hold of me and wanted me to come do some stuff for them, and I knew it was a... I remember the first, he brought me down to Tampa, and they had like a Team CZW thing, like a tournament called the Jeff Peterson Cup that was in Tampa. And we, he brought. He wanted to bring like a CZW team down. There was like it was like a team competition thing. It was like a big tournament. So one team versus another team, kind of thing. Yeah, and that was the first time I had worked for him, and I cut some promos down there and everything. I remember him, and he was immediately like, "You need to come to Philly next weekend and do this Dragon Gate USA pay per view." And I was like, "All right." So just a pay per view, like out of the gate. Yeah. Like, wow. And I knew working for him would be important because he's kind of a guy who's kind of championed and pushed and been like a PR guy for some of for all the really big like indie names like Brian Danielson and mm-hmm. Punk and Joe and all those types of guys. I knew like if he started like squawking about me, it would get my name out there even further. Mm-hmm. So I started working for him, and then it was like not even that much longer later, I randomly got a call from WWE because I just like it took so long to get any buzz going. But then once I did, it all just snowballed like really, really, really quickly. And then I had enough of a buzz where somebody saw something and passed some tape along or whatever. And uh, Joey Mercury was in FCW at the time, and he was probably the uh, impetus to be like, we told uh, whoever was the town relations guy who's not there anymore. He was like, pretty much like, we got to get this guy. And he was like, awesome. All right, give him a shot. You know, like, not, and it wasn't like they scouted me out or I was the biggest deal in the world or they backed the truck a load of money to my house or anything like that. It just was like, uh, just randomly, like, hey, let's get this dude a shot. And they randomly, randomly gave me a call. It had to be a big, if you think about it, did that moment hit you that I got the I got the call? Oh, yeah. At first, I thought it was a joke. Because, <laughs> <laughs> you know, people screw with you like, hey, this is, or like, hey, this is Vince McMahon. Why don't you come to Monday Night Raw? And you're like, <laughs> whatever. I was like, <laughs> this dude called me. I thought he was like, I didn't think it was real, but I was like, was somebody screwing me? Like, but I kind of didn't think it was real. When I got off the phone with him, I'm like, I think somebody just screwing with me. Anyway, whatever. And then a little bit later, Joey Mercury called me, who I'd worked with once before, so I could recognize his voice on the phone. I knew he was down there. And he's like, hey, man, did you get a call today? And I went, oh, oh yeah, it was real. <laughs> <laughs> I thought it's fake right oh, after shit. that point. <laughs> yeah, kind of like, I kind of yeah, yeah, was yeah. like, I was like, pretty sure that was fake. Why would they just randomly call me? But then when Joey called me, I was like, I was like you got a call today? I'm like, yeah. And he's like, congratulations, man. We're, we're trying to get some good guys down here. He's like, you know, we can't wait for you to get down here. You know, we need guys like you. And I was like trying to process it real quick. I'm like, oh, shit. I'm, I'm like, I'm going to WWE. Like, I was doing good, but like uh, making a lot of poor life decisions, getting in trouble, doing stupid stuff, not in a really good place in life at that point you know Mm -hmm. as soon as I got that call I was like I knew this is like my one shot and I wasn't gonna screw it up so like I was bound and determined to make this opportunity like to not screw it up right like I was gifted this one uh opportunity by the universe and it's up to me to to make the most of it so I uh I was living in Philly at the time with my boy uh Dev and uh had no possessions to my name I literally had my wrestling bag, like a few books, and this like really crappy beater car that, and uh, just put everything in the car. And I had like whatever cash I had to my name. They give you, they give you like a moving bonus. They give you like fifteen hundred bucks or something so to pay for like your move, yeah, like moving truck and stuff like that. So that was basically the only cash I had, and I couldn't even cash the check, right? Because I didn't have a bank account at the time. So <laughs> um, yeah, so my buddy's girlfriend. I had to go to the bank with her and she had to like co-sign it for me and cash it out of her account because I didn't I didn't have a bank account. Literally just had a wad of cash. And uh, so I drove down there like 24 hours straight, got there like in the morning. It was all, the sun's like, I've been up for 24 hours. The sun in Tampa is like beating in my face and stuff. I'm all confused. I'm like, uh. It's hot. It's and, gross. Uh, I couldn't get in an apartment because I didn't have like 
any credit or anything. And uh, I'd had like an eviction on my record from like years ago. Mm-hmm. So, so I couldn't, I didn't have any luck getting an apartment. And they're like, yeah, you know, there's some guys that need roommates we can put you in touch. But I was like kind of like too proud and embarrassed or like just antisocial to like even ask for help or anything, you know? Right. So I was like, I'll figure this out myself. So I somehow acquired this room on Craigslist. <laughs> that was like in this house where they were renting rooms for just a hundred bucks a week in cash. Wow. And it was just like this little room that's about the size of this room or smaller. It was like a rectangle shape in this dumpy house off Dale Mabry in Tampa. <laughs> wow. And uh, it was just like this Maybe tiny little bed that was probably full of riddled with disease. Look, I didn't catch anything. There'd be cockroaches scurrying across the floor. Oh, yeah. It had a door that just opened up to the backyard and there was just like all kinds of weird like car parts and like a weird washing machine in the yard and stuff like it, it was basically a giant crack then they were like uh, there was a knife fight once too right out front like well i was like trying to sleep and come out of this commotion and like one of the dudes who lived in the uh, other rooms was like sitting there wielding this knife he was like nuts and it was like everybody sitting there 10 seconds later after i walked out of the door cops ran in and tackled him and i was like i'm just gonna go back to my room now <laughs> So I, I lived there for about a year, and I would just walk to uh, walk to training. That car made it all the way to Tampa, got me there, but it didn't last much longer. It died oh. pretty quickly. But uh, last her off. Yeah, so I'd walk to the training every day, and I, I'd come in early. I'd stay late. I was working on stuff. I was like, I got really a lot better over that period of time. Mm-hmm. As far as like, I was like, I'm getting the best shape of my life. I'm gonna work on everything I need to work on. I'm really gonna like expand and improve on everything, and I really uh. Because a lot of people said, you know, they're like, oh, he's never going to make it in WWE because that's PG company is squeaky clean. If he can't, like, bleed and swear and cuss and everything, he's never going to. No, nobody in their million years thought I was going to, like, actually succeed at being a WWE product. But that was my mission that I was focused on every day when I was down there and uh, succeeded, I think. Cause, a little bit. Yeah, yeah. yeah. yeah it, was quite a run. <laughs> it, really, it really was quite a run, wasn't it? I mean, if you look back on it. Yeah, it's a pretty good run. Yeah, like, crazy. Yeah. I was real lucky to have a good uh, starting uh, starting off point being in the shield and everything like that, which, you know, we talked about uh, ad nauseum, you know, all those stories. Yeah. Right. But I couldn't have, uh, couldn't ask for a better start and uh, really. Because uh, that kind of catapulted you. Yeah, you can't ask for a much better start than that. You know, yeah. to, and back then, a lot of guys didn't get as much. Uh, it was a lot harder to kind of break in, I think, back then. Because when we were in developmental, we had a real chip on our shoulder because we're like, we're as good as anybody up there, but we're stuck down here. Because back then it wasn't like NXT and stuff like it is now. Right. You felt like you're on an island. Like they, like you misfit know, toys. Kind yeah, of thing. you make a few hundred bucks a week or whatever, but like they don't pay attention to you. If somebody from the office ever comes down, it's like a big deal. You know, you try to like get a hold of people and pitch ideas. You can't really, you're just kind of like stuck out on this island and like most people don't get off. Mm-hmm. Every once in a while, somebody will be like, oh, it's like, some oh, somebody got the golden ticket and he gets to go up and try or whatever. But even if you got a chance to get up and go on TV, that you would actually break through and be successful was kind of a, a lesser chance, I think. So same kind of mentality. When we got this tiny little shred of opportunity, we're like, no, really nobody's, nobody's it. taking it away from us. Right. So like... It was like a real all for one mentality. We were like, screw everybody else. We're taking this opportunity, you know? So it was real exciting for the first, uh, first couple of years. It's like, you start making a little money. That's a cool feeling. You know, like, Ooh, okay. Like <laughs> I can eat, I can like buy stuff. Mm-hmm. And even, even just like, like I said, it's like, we we're all just nobodies, nobody had any idea who we were. And then like a few months later, we're like the freaking backstreet boys. Mm-hmm. We're like doing signings and malls and like teenage girls are running up to us and stuff and people are getting tattoos of their names on them and like oh, all, went from being like a complete nobody to like, oh my God, we're like famous is so weird and it's still weird. So it was like, that was a pretty exciting time because it was also like new and stuff. And uh, even back then I was like, I don't know how long this is going to last. So enjoy it while you can. I was like, I'm saving all my money. I'm like, fig- I was like, if I can get a good five year run. I'll be good. So I, for the first couple of years, I didn't even ha- own a car because I'm like, I'm never home. We did Friday, Saturday, Sunday, Monday, Tuesday for two years straight. Oh my God. So I was like home for 36 hours. I'm like, I don't even need a car. So I would just like 
rent a car for 20 bucks from the airport for like a day. And I just, until I saved up enough money, and then I bought my dream truck. What's your dream truck? It was a Dodge Ram. Cool. Four wheel drive. I got the little camera, XM radio, black. It's like shiny black or matte black? (laughs) Oh, it's shiny. Nice. Nice. I saved up for like two years, and then once I had enough for it where I could just buy in cash, I just walked right in and was like, I'll have one of these, please. Thank you. (laughs) And I'm going to drive that until it dies. Yeah. I'm good. And then you get to, you know, and then like buy a house and stuff for the first time, you know, stuff like that. That's all like very exciting, you know, considering how this, uh, that initial trip to Tampa started. Yeah. They, but uh, when that run was time to end, it was a, uh, it was definitely a time, time that we parted our ways. Our uh, that place was very good to me, and mm-hmm. the universe was very good to me for giving me that opportunity. But uh, it was time for us to go our separate ways. It was a mutually beneficial relationship for a while, and it just uh, ran its course. Yep. And now I'm sitting here talking to you. Yeah. Yes. So we're talking to John Moxley. We want to talk about his AEW appearance and the move from the WWE to where he is now. So we're here, John Moxley, talking a lot about how you got to WWE, a little bit about your stuff on the indies, getting discovered, all that. Uh, and you've talked a lot in various different venues and media about kind of your time there with the Shield and whatnot. But, you know, coming to AEW, like, when did you get the call? Um, so I knew for about eight months prior to showing up in AEW, I knew I was leaving there. Right. I didn't know where I was going to go or what I was going to do or uh, I kind of was thinking I'll just kind of take myself off Broadway so to speak mm-hmm. go wrestle in Japan or like wrestle under a friggin mask or something I, I don't know I wanted to like just do something get new. a new yeah I was like I couldn't really picture what I wanted to do or how I wanted to wrestle or whatever but uh, you know I wasn't like okay I'm going to go and be on every show like the former WWE superstar Dean Ambrose or whatever and like gouge people for money or anything like that or try to make money <laughs> try to make money off my name or anything like that like, right. I was trying to leave that in the past you just wanted to enjoy wrestling yeah and I figured like I would just kind of go out of the spotlight for a long time and then like once I came up with a new thing and was ready to uh, come back whether it be a year or two years then I'll kind of try to emerge on the national scene again and I was paying attention to like Ring of Honor Impact Japan uh, I knew I wanted to go to Japan for sure because I'd always loved wrestling over there when we go for uh, WWE because I just love the fans over there and it's just a different culture and style and uh, I got a real taste for it the couple of times I was able to go. So I knew I wanted to go back and kind of always had the feeling that I could in the back of my mind. So I was thinking I was going to pretty much disappear and then come back later on when I got like a new shtick of some sort or whatever. Right. That didn't happen at all. No. Not even close. <laughs> nope. A little bit before everybody knew about all the, the AEW stuff and the TV deal and all this was like top secret stuff. And I'm like, I've always been uh, friends with Cody, mm-hmm. share, you know, passion for wrestling, uh, see a lot of things the same way, love old school wrestling. Had a great relationship with Dusty. I work with Cody, you know, we were in a main event or a WrestleMania match together even. Yep. Where I almost died. Oh, I remember that one. Yeah. I remember that one. And uh, always maintained a friendship with Jericho, who's mm. coming here. And, uh, you know, we always talk about, like, Sasquatches and stuff like that. I knew he was doing stuff outside of WWE. And they're telling me about this AEW thing, and I'm like, that sounds really awesome, but, like, you know, I'll believe it when I see it kind of thing. Like, huh. But Mm -hmm. all the infrastructure and stuff was getting put into place so much before everybody knew about it. Oh, absolutely. Which was smart that they didn't come out with all these big promises right out of the gate and then not deliver like most companies do. Like... All this stuff was set in stone like before fans even knew about it, which mm-hmm. is it's amazing that this is all at, like real. You know, it's still crazy because I mean, a year ago this there was like no other legit alternative, and now it's like, I mean, people have been fans have been wanting this for years. Wrestlers have been wanting this for years. This yeah. is this is what's ne- something that business has needed for so many years, and it's like it's finally here. Right, like it's legit. It's not going away. We just signed a new contract. You know, so it's one cool. more years, dude. Yeah, and. uh when it was like, oh, the first show is double or nothing, it's May something. It was like three weeks after my contract was going to be up. And it was in Vegas. Which Just is where you live right it now. It didn't matter that it was in Vegas. But something about it being in Vegas made it even more of like a sign. Mm-hmm. Like, I don't, all I got to do is just drive over. I don't even have to get on a plane. Like, it was like, like, I didn't even find that show. That show found me. Like, all the signs in the universe were like pointing me there, you know? So right. I was like, all right. 
I guess we're doing this. And uh, at the time, too, to be perfectly honest, like, I didn't know, like, I didn't know if people were going to cheer, if they are going to boo, if they are going to not make any noise at all. That's kind of why I was like, I got to go off Broadway for a while, because I'm like, I just feel like my reputation had been tarnished so bad that I was like, I, I had to start, like, from scratch again or something. Like, uh, Why do you say that? Because of the character? Because of the... Yeah. Because of the writing and all that. Yeah, I mean, once you get popped in the ass with a syringe on TV and, like, dress up like a teddy bear and DDT people and shit like that, like, it's yeah. like... I got you. Yeah. I remember one time standing in the ring in a bear suit for some reason. I can't even explain to you why I'm standing in the ring in a bear suit. <laughs> and, like, DDT to Miz or something and take off my bear hat. And, like, <laughs> it's like, you know, you get the... Pavlonian kind of response, like, hey, but I remember just thinking, like, this is so stupid. This is not even, like, funny or entertaining. I just remember standing in the ring feeling like I've hit rock bottom. Mm. Mm. Like, I'm just done. This sucks. I may never, oh, God. What if I, I'm just like, what if I become in this bear suit? <laughs> but I've had many moments like that. <laughs> right. So, like, I was scared that uh, fans outside of WWE they want an alternative. Mm -hmm. They're they're coming to Ring of Honor or Impact or uh, AEW or whatever because they don't want Monday Night Raw and they don't want WWE stuff. And if I was like scared that I was so synonymous with like WWE crap that I'd walk out and they'd be like, "Oh God, the idiot from WWE with the oh God, what are you gonna do? Hit somebody with a hot dog? Jesus Christ, <laughs> this company's gone to hell. I can't believe they brought the, the hot dog, hot dog guy." Yeah. I was scared of that. So it know. was the exact opposite, though. Yeah, it which really I can never, that room exploded. I can never be. Uh, I can never uh, explain my gratitude toward the people that were in the building that night for just immediately embracing and accepting me as myself, mm -hmm. and that like not uh, putting any of WWE's crap onto me. Mm -hmm. You know, you came in with a fresh slate, and I think everybody just accepted you that way. Yeah, which I can never be uh, more uh, grateful for. So, I, so so then it was just like off to the races. Like I thought it was going to be this long rehabilitation process for nope, myself. You're there, ready to go. But, like I was like, do I even remember how to wrestle anymore? I don't even know. But it was just like it all came back so quickly. It was like almost like I'd been asleep for years, and like I woke up out of a nap. Mm -hmm. It really is like a totally different guy who was like in jail, and like oh John's out of jail. Cool, sweet, he's back. It's hard to even explain, like. Mm -hmm. For the first match I had was back in was in Japan. And I remember being like, it was like second to last on the show. It was a big match. It was like a debut match. First match in Japan, uh, for New Japan, which is the biggest company over there. I'm following Hiroshi friggin' Tanahashi. Yeah. Who's like the John Cena of Japan. Yep. He's on right before me. So I'm like, this is a really, this is a tall order. And I'm like, I can't picture it. I just couldn't picture what I was going to do or how I was even going to wrestle or I, I just I couldn't picture it so I was just like alright I'm just going to empty my mind of everything and just not have any like expectations not go out there and try real hard to be something because then people see through that if you try to be something you're not or I don't, mm -hmm. don't want to like try too hard like to be something new or whatever I'm just going to relax and be so just be and I remember like right, right before that match I was like remarkably calm really because looking at the situation, I was like, I should be so nervous right now. But I'm like, I remember joking about it. I'm like, almost laughing. I'm like, I'm remar so remarkably calm right now. And I think it's because like, I'd already given up everything. There was like nothing left to lose. Yeah, exactly. What's the worst that could happen? In my mind, I'm like, I think the whole world thinks I suck already. So I'm like, I don't know, screw it. Whatever happens, happens. And then two minutes into the match, all these like little gears in my brain start clicking. And I'm like beating the holy hell out of my opponent, a guy named Juice Robinson. And like, you guys like, knew each other from NXT. Yeah, he was one of my buddies in Tampa, which was great. I couldn't have asked for a better uh, opponent right off the bat than him. And like, it's just this wild fight. There's like blood. I'm like beating the hell out of him. I'm like, there's like an energy in the building. Everything's like, cl and it was like it all just came back to me. I'm like, Oh, yeah, this is how I used to wrestle all the time. This is what I naturally do. If you just throw me out there with no plan, this is what happens. And mm -hmm. I'm like, 
oh, this feels so good. It was like stretching my legs for the first time in years. I was like, oh, God. And I, like after the the response we got after the in the building and then like when I got to the bag, it was just like, I'm fucking back. Mm-hmm. I'm back. Like already, like here we go. Like I'm off to the races. So like, and it's just been like uh, continually like that ever since, getting to wrestle all these different great opponents like that are in this crazy roster of AEW. It's just like a smorgasbord of different styles and, and stuff to work with. And uh, I'm just having the just having the time of my life. I'm just waiting for something bad to happen. The wheels are falling. <laughs> the coming. other shoot a job. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, I mean, last year was like, last year was like a really up and down year. Like 20, what year is it now? It's 2020. So 2019. 2019. I started 2019 off at the absolute lowest I've been probably since like that period in like 2007 where I was describing earlier. Mm-hmm. Where I just couldn't get booked anywhere. Mm-hmm. That's probably the only other point that was as low from like purely professional standpoint. Started off as low as you could possibly get. Had some weird ups and downs trying to navigate that last few months there without anything bad happening. Because I, I kept thinking, like, something bad is going to happen. Like, right. There's no way this is going to end this amicably. Like, it's, I, I was just so nervous. I was like, I just got to get to the finish line without anything bad happening. And I did. And then I had a little bit of, little bit of time off. And then double So I went from, like, starting the year off at the absolute low to double or nothing is about as high as you can get. Right. And then right into, like, Japan, like, as high as you can get to, like, uh, full gear, high as you can get. You're like, just all these great moments, you know. But the, also, then I had a couple of different injuries. I had to get a surgery that just took me, like, right back down. When I had to pull out of the all-out pay-per-view, I was just, like, gutted. I'd never had to, like, really pull out of a match before that I mm-hmm. could think of. And there was such a big match. We sold so many tickets so fast. And it was like, and I was like, oh, God. This recurring, nagging thing. That's like a WWE injury that's come back. Still to following bite, you. That was biting me. Yeah, I felt like it had been following me. It was like, it was like, I felt like WWE got the last laugh. <laughs> like they were like, ha, gotcha. This is what you get, motherfucker. <laughs> I was like, oh. But then, so I had to recover from that probably came back quicker than I should have because uh but I was like we're starting on TV and I, I gotta be there and I don't wanna I don't wanna miss a month of the you know like it's like the maiden voyage you know October 2nd I was right. like I gotta be there so sure. I had another thing I had a problem with my C6 and 7 in my neck that I didn't really make a big deal out or talk about cause I just worked through it until I finally got it I was in Japan for about five weeks and I had just like I had a pinched nerve mm-hmm that was just like creating this horrible pain that was going like all the way down into my elbow, like up into my neck and my shoulder to where like my left arm started to like, I couldn't fire my left pec Mm -hmm. or my left tricep and they started to kind of like shrink and kind of atrophy a little bit. So I'd be like about to go off for a match and trying to warm up and I literally couldn't do five pushups. Like my right side was good, but my left side was all, so I was like, that was freaky. But when I got properly diagnosed and then did about a month of like spinal decompression, now it's like pretty good. Yeah, still like lingers a little bit, but it's not painful. And I, I'll continue doing that and kind of helping that out and staying on top of that and keep myself healthy. So that that was two horrible, really bad things I had to work through. That were like low points, and then come back up with like more high points, and then ended the year strong. But 2020 so far, might it is really good. Might end up being my best year of my career really from a professional excited, standpoint. Man. Yeah. Started out good with a good match with Trent on New Year's Day. Somehow I wasn't hung over on New Year's Day. I think you were the first person that was like, man, that's going to be the worst show ever. Yeah, we partied hard the night before. Yeah, somehow. Made it, had a, started out a good match with Trent. And really successful trips to Japan. A good match with Sam Guevara, mm-hmm. Darby Allen. You know, so, like, so like, I'm just like having fun. Like Big pay-per-view coming up. Yeah, so uh, momentum. Got 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 the momentum rolling again, right? But, uh, yeah, I mean, you're always gonna have ups and downs, you know. So like, last up, last year was crazy highs and lows. Hopefully this year is just uh, just highs. Let's let's stay high, baby. Yeah. Going back to double or nothing with the internet the way it is and everybody knowing everything, you surprised that your your appearance kept was kept secret like that? I was totally surprised. I mean, like, not surprised because I know and trust the people that knew, and right. only a tiny handful of people knew, right? I'm sure there's a million people out there that are like fake journalists that go, oh, I told you, because right. there's an obvious rumor because right. the contract just happens to come up 
three weeks before this AEW thing. So and it was such an odd, yeah. obviously, like everybody was talking about it. Like, could this happen? But nobody actually had any information. Right. You know, it was kept super tight. So I think that really helped, you know, the, uh, cause I think a lot of people are like, really not going to believe it till we see it kind of thing. Sure. I remember all of us were in the back. And like Jericho's doing the promo, mm-hmm. the crowd starts going nuts. Right. And we're like, what the hell is happening? Like, we literally, like, no one in the back knew. Right. And we're just sort of losing our shit. Cause we're like, oh my God, he's here. It was right. like, we're all marking out for it. Yeah. It was, it was really, great. One of the best decisions I ever made, too, was making that uh, trailer video. Oh, that trailer video was tight. That paid off exponentially. Cause I think that really helped with, that was kind of the precursor to Double or Nothing. Well, and that kind of like reintroduced the people that only knew you as Dean Ambrose as like, no, this is actually who I am. This is who I was before. Now I'm coming back. Yeah, because I just wanted to. I, I didn't. Yeah, like I said, like I was scared of getting that. Like, oh god, the hot dog guy's back. I can't believe they hired the Teddy hot dog Bear, guy. Teddy Bear, Mitch the Plant. I wanted to like ahead of time be like, <laughs> okay, we're starting fresh. <laughs> no hot dogs. This is not you know hot dog free zone. I wanted to. Yeah, I wanted to make sure that everybody knew like something different was coming to where you know, but I wanted people to not know where I was going to show up. A lot of people thought that I was just going to show back up in WWE. That it was just like it. Because it was so... I thought it was a work. Yeah, everybody. Nobody, Cause they were yeah, super yeah. amicable about it. And I'm like, they, they don't do this historically, yeah. right? Like, yeah, which made it... He's going to show up at like SummerSlam. Like, which, that's how this shit works. Yeah, which benefited me. So, like, no, you know, nobody really knew where I was going to pop up. So, I think that was like the... Uh, I think that helped kind of the reaction, too. Like, they knew... Because they, they were chanting Moxley. Mm-hmm. So, that... Everybody was instantly on the same page, clean slate, all good. Like, like all of your concerns are gone. Yeah, like great feeling, just like incredible sense of relief. Like, because it had been a long, it had been a long few months leading up to that. (laughs) So, well, it's it started off a great year, and of course, we got Revolution coming up, and that match with Chris Jericho has everybody's attention. Wanted to ask you though that you're here, and your wife Renee is still in the WWE. How does that dynamic work? That's pretty good. Like, uh, see, see, we're what a true power couple. We got <laughs> our household. <laughs> our, ho- our household got revenue streams coming from Fox, WWE, <laughs> AEW, New Japan, other all the other projects. Making all involved. the then, money. Wow. Yeah, like we go wherever we want. My wife came to Tokyo Dome the other day. I walk right into. I'd walk right into freaking Monday Night Raw tomorrow backstage if I wanted to. Nobody say nothing. No, I'm just kidding. They'd kick me out. <laughs> I would never do that. I mean, she came out to like the the holiday party too. Yeah. The New Year's, like, and we're just all like, hey. Yeah, it's what's all up? like it's all. Uh, I think we kind of uh, uh, what's the word I'm looking for? We kind of surpassed any kind of like bull crap kind of thing. You know what I mean? Right. And she's not gonna. She's such a valuable asset there, and uh, their careers, you know, on the up. She's got big stuff coming, and. Uh, Whatever her uh, ultimate goals are, whether they lie in wrestling or outside of it, you know, she'll be going after that, you know, super hardcore, and I'll be right behind her. You know, she's been super behind me throughout this whole thing, you know. When I told, when I told her I was leaving, was like, or when I was been talking about it, you know, like I remember New Year's Eve that year, I was just sitting there getting all surly and miserable and just going like, I don't know, I'm just not even going to resign, just go to Japan. She's like, just like, meh, nah, you know. And she's like, good, <laughs> go, do it. I'm like, be happy. Good, maybe I will. <laughs> <laughs> like, that was like her attitude. It's like, yeah. so. But all that being said, it'd be so much easier if she would just like, if she was just here. <laughs> make my life so much easier. <laughs> she just, if she just make my life easier, she would just drop all her career aspirations and just follow me around the world while I do wrestling. Wouldn't that be great? Yeah, but yeah, that, yeah. that'd be but a that, couple of uh, revenue streams you wouldn't have. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> no, but uh she said two from a couple seconds. That's not gonna yeah, she's she's a woman in power, a woman in charge. She's awesome. Doing she stuff. really is. She, I'm hoping she gets a today show. Oh one that'd of be those awesome. types of gigs, you know. I might yeah. have moved to New York. But yeah, that as long then, as you then, 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 I, then I can just truly check out and just get fat. <laughs> <laughs> not worry about it, yeah, uh, yeah. your left side. Being able to do push ups. You don't need to do push ups yeah, at exactly. all. That's right. You're it's really fine. Good. Just wrestle on a t shirt, man. Yeah. You're good. That's the ultimate goal. She gets like, you know, that Kelly Rippa gig. Oh, and she yeah. She'd be my sugar mama, and I'll just. You wrestle like once a year? Yeah, I'll just do a random indie show once a year. I'll just look, I'll look like Arn Anderson. <laughs> <laughs> just... <laughs> uh, oh, my God. So what do you think? You, you mentioned about some of the matches you've had. You mentioned in, uh, Darby Allen. What do you think overall the talent we have? I think it's uh, we've got some really great young 
stars here. Oh yeah, it's amazing and it's inspiring, man. It gets you like excited to to come to work. Like the cool thing for me to watch is that there's all these guys that are like so young and they have this opportunity at such a young age where they get to be on a national stage and nobody's like trying to control them or tell them what they should be or nobody's walking around on eggshells. Nobody's, you know, like Darby Allen's not showing up to the show wearing a suit saying yes sir, no sir. Not trying, to, his gear. not trying to step on anybody's toes, scared of everybody. You know what I mean? That's when you're a young guy, you know, in years past, you know, I don't know what it's like there now, but in years past, that's kind of how it was there. You know, you got to try to not piss anybody off. You know, everybody here is just like, cool man and uh to see these guys to have a shot on a national stage and not be manipulated or hindered or twisted and they just literally get to go out and be themselves and do what they do that's so awesome to watch it makes you want to be a part of it like yeah i'm like oh, i want to get in the ring with these dudes sure you know because like i'm a freaking old man at this point you know i see these dudes doing all these crazy moves and stuff and i'm like i'll get in there with you and i'm like i want them to teach me something you know mm-hmm I want to like learn from all these guys. You know, there's so so many different styles here, and just so many great. Like everybody's awesome. I don't, you know, we don't really have anybody who sucks. <laughs> it's pretty great. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> AW where nobody sucks. It's our Look, new tagline. We uh, we appreciate your time, and I know uh, you got anything coming up. I know you're in. You're doing a movie. One to. I just finished one. Yeah. You just finished a movie. Where okay, got a deal going on right now. Me and uh, my partner who made that video we were talking about. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Made a, he made a couple of different trailers for me. One for Japan, one for that, and uh, we've done a couple other projects together. So we're like, dude, what if we made an actual movie? And I'm like, you think we could do that? He's like, yeah, I think we could. And kind of use, use our projects together as kind of a proof of concept of kind of thing, you know, like create, write our own movie and be in control of it, you know? Not for like money, not to like try to make some bazillion dollars or anything like who cares if nobody ever watches it but just to do it Mm -hmm. that'd be so much fun to like have a dvd of like yeah this is our movie we made or like basically so the goal is to get somebody to give us a bunch of money to go make our movie right so i had a dream i had an idea for a script he had one similar we kind of blended them together and uh it's it's moving along. We got it like in the process. Like, What's the name of the movie? My, can, I can't tell you that yet. Oh, okay. <laughs> it's a great. It might be the greatest action movie of all time. Oh shit. Yeah. Oh shit. Yeah, but we already like we're <laughs> like it's like moving along. We're like talking to people and to, like, I mean it may actually happen one day. It might not ever happen, but it is yeah. look you know. So it's, that's cool you know because now I can do anything you know I'm not sure. uh, yeah I don't have to ask permission and do anything. No AEW is just like cool you want to make a movie great have fun. Yeah yeah so that's a cool side project and uh, got a, a big show coming up in Europe mm. pretty soon so I've been it, kind of been itching to get back to Europe I don't know if it's announced yet or not I guess I'm announcing it now <laughs> but uh, it's a big show in Dublin at a stadium in Dublin I've been kind of itching to get back to Europe I haven't been back since I used to go over to WWE because I love the crowds over there in the UK, Scotland, Ireland, all over Europe. You're just great wrestling fans, you know. So I'm kind of itching to get back over there, so I'm going back over there, I think, in March. And uh, back and forth to Japan when uh, when I got the time. You know, the last few weeks, it's just going to normalize for a while now. But I had a bunch of, like, back and forth to Japan and here that was, like, when it looked... And, and that freaking boat had to go to the Bahamas, too. Right. <laughs> so like it was, but it all seemed like it all fell in the same few week period. And I was looking at it and I was like, "Oh my god!" It looked really like when you look at the schedule, it was like so daunting. I'm like, "Oh my god, this is gonna suck." So I was like, I had to like, I'm like, okay, just take it one thing at a time, just get this done, and then get this done, and then get it. So got here last night and I was like, okay, this is kind of the last show of kind of like this crazy period, mm-hmm. and now. Now I get to go home for a few days and so forth. But now, now I can just gear up for the pay per view. So pretty good. Yeah. So uh, my problem is just not overextending myself. Right. Well, yeah. it's been a great, uh, it's been a great journey from Heartland Wrestling, a teenager in Cincinnati, to here. We appreciate your time, buddy. Oh, anytime. We yeah, this was it. a great talk. Thank yes, you. It really was. A reminder: you can subscribe to AEW's Unrestricted Podcast for free. For free. And that's whenever, you, wherever you get your podcast. Wherever. And tune in to AEW Dynamite. When is that? Uh, it's uh, 8 o'clock Eastern, 7 o'clock Central. That was my quiz for the day. Oh, yeah. All, every Wednesday. At a, how did you not figure that out yet? <laughs> On TNT. Been announcing this thing for months. <laughs> <laughs> Wait, yes, it's Wednesday nights, everyone. <laughs>
if you don't know. If you're listening to the podcast, you probably know when Dynamite airs. <laughs> I'm Tony Schiavone. I'm Aubrey Edwards. And this is AEW Unrestricted. Thanks a lot for being with us. Thank you.